Um, so my name is Alex. Uh, I teach nonviolent communication, um, amongst a million other things I do in my life. But I'm here today to share nonviolent communication with you, uh, and that's exciting to me. Um, so where to begin? Nonviolent communication uh, starts with a book written by Marshall Rosenberg uh, that he wrote out of his work in the civil rights movement. Uh, Marshall Rosenberg was involved in that and then studied the works of uh, Dr. King and Gandhi and just kind of analyzed their speech patterns, well, how they communicated, how they uh, conveyed their ideas, and then distilled it into a, uh, like a distilled method of communicating um, that we'll look at shortly. Uh, so by no means does Marshall Rosenberg claim that he made this up or came up with the idea. It's a lot of the concepts we're going to talk about today, people are going to be like, yeah, I knew about that. <laughs> um, and a lot of the things are very, uh, we're aware of them, but it's good to keep them at the forefront. And we're going to talk about some things that we probably don't really know about um, or really keep it on the forefront of our minds often. So what nonviolent communication really tries to strive for is oftentimes we find ourselves in situations of apparent conflict where we're fighting with each other uh, and we want to change those situations of apparent conflict into situations of cooperation. Situations where we're not trying to get my needs met and I don't care whether your needs get met or not, but rather let's meet everyone's needs. Let's get together and find a solution that works for all of us involved. Uh, rather than just one or, or a small group of individuals. So how do we do that, right? <laughs> That's the hard part, yeah. <laughs> that sounds really nice, but how do you do that? Um, well, a quick, simple uh, start to that would be um, what often happens in those conflict situations is you get caught up in your fight, flight, or freeze reaction, right? Your adrenaline <coughs> starts running, um, now all of a sudden you're either got to fight this opponent, that you got to run away from this opponent, or you're just a deer in the headlight and you're just like, oh, I can't do anything. <laughs> um, so we want to, ultimately, we're trying to sidestep activating that fight, flight, or freeze reaction in ourselves and in other people that we're communicating with. Um, we want to just avoid that altogether and staying in that calmer, uh, normal mental state where we're not activated to this I have no choices except for these three things. Um, it's a lot easier to communicate, to find solutions that actually work for everyone because we're calmer, we have more patience, we have more time. Uh, <coughs> and a lot of that has to do with looking past uh, what I'm going to call often uh, enemy images that we construct of other people and that we construct <coughs> of ourselves. Um, so often we make moralistic judgments about other people in those conflict situations where like, well that person's a jerk, that person's a bad person, or we'll make other moralistic judgments that that person's a good person, that person's righteous and virtuous and I need to follow them. Uh, but making those kinds of moralistic judgments creates images of people rather than really seeing who they really are rather than really connecting with the real person that's there. If you all want to grab uh, handouts as you come in, that'd be fantastic. Um, so we want to deconstruct those images, right? We don't want to see images, we want to see the true empathetic human beings that really exist. Uh, we don't want to see idols, basically, or, or demons. Um, so the goal, what is, what is the goal of nonviolent communication? The goal is not to get what we want. If your goal in using, if you take from this class and go home and try to use nonviolent communication to get everything that you want and it's not working, the reason is that that's not the intended goal. <laughs> um, the goal of nonviolent communication is to develop and build relationships and connections based on honesty and empathy. That's the only goal we have. It's the only goal we have. It's our intention behind everything we do, every way that we communicate, is to have the intention and the goal to connect authentically, honestly, in other words, and to do that connection empathetically. But it's hard in our, in, in our culture, right? We live in a domination culture where, uh, where the tools that we're taught to get what we want and to get social change is to go to anger and to go to guilt 
and to go to shame and to go to moralistic judgments. Um, how often do we hear, how dare you vote for three strike laws? Those are racist policies and you're promoting racist policies. You're perpetuating a racist system. I heard that. I'm not going to want to communicate with you. I'm not going to want to sit and have a dialogue about what the real problem is with three strike laws. And there are, obviously. Um, but that's how we're often taught that that's how you get social change happen. Similarly, on the flip side, how often do we hear, uh, what do you mean you support regulating marijuana? Don't you know that that will only help the cartels? Don't you know that it's just going to result in uh, social decay? Uh, that you're just going to be lazy all day? Um, <laughs> but <laughs> so all of that though, both sides. So you're making an enemy image of the other person. You when you say, when or the person when they say that remark. You know, three strike laws are racist policies, and you're an immoral politician. When I say that, I'm making an enemy image of that politician. When the politician says you're just a lazy dope addict, they're making an enemy image of of you. And then the next trick. Is then once I hear that, so once I'm the politician has heard that, I'm also in my fight flight freeze reaction. I'm I'm dealing with an opponent who's trying to kill me, and <coughs> I have to fight back against it. So now I'm going to develop an enemy image back at them. Now that I'm doing that, they're going to shoot it back at me, and then we just spiral out of control. Um, so NBC really tries for an alternative to that system. Really tries for an alternative to that enemy image. You're my enemy, I'm here to get what I want, and, and you're not going to get what you want. System. So, let's actually, so that's just the intro. Let's get into the actual meat and potatoes of what nonviolent communication is now. Um, so, there's two aspects to nonviolent communication. Um, the first is empathy. I'm going to talk about empathy, and then we'll go to the second part later. So, empathy. What is empathy? Right? That's like a nice term we like to throw around a lot. Let's be empathetic with people. Let's be really nice and ooey gooey. But what does that mean? Well, in my analysis, and this is just my personal opinion at this point, um, I think empathy has two parts to it. Uh, one part is it's a felt experience. When you're engaged in empathy, you are feeling. Uh, the, you are feeling the pain of the other person. You're experiencing that with them. The second part of it is active listening. And uh, we're going to go through each part of those. So, first part is uh, the felt, I want to get at what, this, what I mean by a felt experience of empathy. So you'll see in your handouts you have stories uh, written. Uh, does anyone want to volunteer to, if you want to, uh, yeah. uh, if, does anyone want to volunteer to read that story? I've been talking a lot. And I'm supposed to shoot for like an 80% me not talking thing. So, anyone want to read that story? Cool. Sarah had a long week in front of her. She knew about her presentation on Friday, but she also really wanted to wanted the busted screening to be a success. She can handle it, though. She has <coughs> SSD gear. Her presentation, though, wasn't going so well. Organic chemistry was... Her worst class and the professor was out to get her. She was struggling to come up with the first slide. The busted screening wasn't going that much better. Three people were missing on Wednesday's meeting. And she found out a fourth person completely forgot to fly her the part of campus that, had, that they had volunteered for. Sarah desperately tried to reach the three missing SSDP members to figure out if they had done what they said they would. One had, the other forgot as well, and she couldn't get in touch with the last one. Feeling panicked, Sarah quickly tried to organize some last minute publicity. Then she remembered her presentation and it was the next morning. She spent the rest of the night putting together slides and hurriedly writing a new script. During her presentation, Sarah felt groggy and distracted. She was worried about that night busted screening. Um, she hadn't heard anyone in class mention the event. An hour before the screening, she walked into the room and started setting up. None of the other members showed up till five minutes before. Only eight non-SSDP members showed up. After the screening, Sarah turned to a friend and explained, I'm sick and tired of SSDP. This is absolutely the worst. 
So how many of us in this room have experienced that? <laughs> yep. Yeah. That's pretty common, right? Yeah. So now I want to just ask, um, how do people individually feel when they hear that story? Empathetic. Empathetic. What do you mean by empathetic? Do you... I can feel how she feels better because I've experienced it myself. Because you've experienced it yourself. And so how would you describe how she feels? Um, frustrated and frustrated. Um, possibly let down by the people that didn't mm. fulfill their part of their responsibility. Disappointed. is a good mm. word. Does anyone else have any feelings that come up for them when they hear that story or, or have any idea of how Sarah might be feeling? What? Stressed out. Yeah. Stressed out. Like at her wits end. Mm -hmm. Everything was riding on her, including she, you know her school, her schoolwork, and also her um, you know her participation in the organization. Right. And, and neither one was going the way she had planned it. So it had her at her wits end. She was just basically stressed out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think she felt defeated. You know, just this feeling like, I don't want to do it anymore, what good is it doing? This sort of just pessimistic outlook. It was kind of like, um, sometimes I feel like, why, why don't the others care as much? You know? Why won't they come? I'm putting all this effort for Some resentment maybe she might be feeling. Neglect, possibly. Neglect. You can also feel for the other members of the group. You can identify with them as well, because mm -hmm. everybody's got their own lives, and this is all something that right. they probably are working on. I mean, you know, this is a group that I mean, I know I'm proud to be part of, and I you know, don't like taking in my group. You know, I'm taking in my group. Mm -hmm. and it's their group. Yeah. So we listed a lot of uh, a lot of negative feelings, right? A lot of sad, a lot of stressed, a lot of desperate and, and alone, lonely. I hear a lot of loneliness in Sarah's story. How many of us would feel differently if we were Sarah? Good, no one is there. It's good. <laughs> um, right, so, so we can feel that. As Sarah's telling us the, that story, as we hear that story, um, we can feel that that same stress and that same exhaustion. James, if you want to grab a handout right at the front there, um, we can feel that uh, just as Sarah is feeling it, right? I mean, I mean, it's not a one-to-one -one feeling. None of us would say we're one-to-one -one feeling exactly what Sarah is feeling. We're not. None of us are in Sarah's head. But there is something about I'm feeling something when I'm listening to that story, um, when I hear about Sarah's situation. So let's go to story number two. And does anyone else want to volunteer to read that one? Cool, go for it. Uh, cool. <clears throat> Joe was elected to Congress in 2008. He was elected on a platform of cleaning up Main Street. And after getting elected, his constituents in no uncertain terms let him know how he could do just that. His office receives letters, emails, and phone calls daily of people in his district who want him to do something about the gangs destroying private property and they want him to re revitalize the downtown areas taken over by the homeless drug <coughs> Joe also has two kids and he reads the same newspaper as his constituents read that document the rising trends of drug use and drug addiction in the United States. He also reads harrowing stories about the destructive power of addiction. So he voted with his fellow party members against eliminating the crack powder cocaine sentencing disparity. And he goes on TV and says, uh, it is the drugs pouring into this country from Central America that are destroying the moral fiber of our once great nation. It's hard for us to hear, right? Us in this room to hear that story. But let's try, let's try really hard and let's, let's try to, what do we think Joe is feeling in his situation? Thinking about his kids. You know, thinking about the welfare and the well-being of his children, you know? You know? He thinks he's doing the best thing, you know? Right. But what is, but I want to get at, um, I love that because that is what Joe's thinking, um, but we're going to get into thoughts and I want to stick with feelings because um, that's really where we connect with others. So why, 
So he thinks he's doing the best thing for his kids. Why does he think he's doing the best things for his kids? Does he have some sort of feeling under that of, of that motivates that thought? Possibly the fear of like what he reads and stuff. Possibly that happening to mm -hmm. his children. You know, he want that to happen. Yeah, that motivates him. Yeah, that fear that that might be his kid next in the paper. Yeah. Responsibility. Yeah. Responsibility. Yeah. I have you, you, and then. You. Uh, like threatened, I think, um, both mm -hmm. in his job and as a parent. Um, so, like on several levels, he just feels like he's not really in control and is trying to gain control. Yeah. Um, if you could call it an emotion, I would say ambition. Because mm. I see the main motive for this is getting elected again. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that is definitely mm. in there. So yeah. it's kind of like long-term investment for him. Mm. He's worried about his job. Mm -hmm. He wants to ensure that his job continues to exist. Sure. Yeah. And, and not only his job, but get promoted, maybe. Right. Yeah. I had a hand over here. Yeah. I think he, a, there's a little bit of disgust or like superiority over this, like these homeless drug cases, you know, uh -huh. just bad people who are just ruining right. society. Yeah. Yeah, there is. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. But is there something. Um, no. No. Is there something that Joe might be feeling about those individuals, I guess? I guess we said before, there's fear because it's so close to home. Mm. That could just easily be someone he knows or his children in a couple of years. Just lack of understanding. I mean, mm. lack yeah. of, you know, mm. having that shared ex having an experience that they, another person might have. So he doesn't have much, much understanding, yeah. Maybe contempt, possibly, just because that's mm. his platform for getting elected to clean up Main Street if he doesn't do that. Mm -hmm. then, yeah. And maybe he, he has contempt for them because he doesn't exactly. understand them. Yeah. Because they're the other. You know, we all have our fear and our anger towards the other. Probably feels pressured mm -hmm. because he keeps getting all those calls and he has to perform well and make everybody happy. So he feels pressured to have to do that. I'm gonna say pride, just cause yeah. like, you know, look at this beautiful life I've built. Why wouldn't anybody else want it? Mm -hmm. I'm gonna pause this here, and I'm gonna ask, try to now put yourself in Joe's feeling. How would we be feeling if we're Joe, and we're the politician, and we're getting emails, and phone calls, and we read the stories about drugs, and no one's, we don't really know anything about drugs. You know, I'm, I, the, Joe is not a, a, a medical doctor. He doesn't really follow the latest science. He reads the Wall Street Journal and CNN, and here's their science. <laughs> yeah. Um, so how would we feel if we were Joe? Getting all this pressure from basically just like one side of this issue, uh -huh. like trying to get him to deal with it. But um, this is when SSDP needs to come in and put pressure on him from the other side. <laughs> well, what do we feel when we feel pressure? Like when we, so I want to get at a little, I want to take it a little deeper. Um, when we feel in a pressure situation, like let's say the midterm or the final is tomorrow and you didn't feel like you studied enough and now you feel pressure, right? You have to, you got to cram in the study material. Is there something underneath that pressure? Anxiety. Anxiety. And what's underneath anxiety? Fear of failure. Fear. Fear of failure. So when Joe feels pressured and he wants to keep his job and wants to get a better job, he's scared about his job. Joe's scared about his job. <laughs> How many of us are scared about our jobs? <laughs> yeah, right? Uh, those people about to graduate who's scared about jobs, right? So that's what I'm trying to get at here, is we can feel that same thing that's going on in Joe. Hard, because Joe, you know, Joe's story used a lot of loaded language. He it uses language of, you know, uh, the the druggy homeless and and moral fiber, and you're destroying everything, and you're the worst. But underneath all that, what Joe's really saying is he's scared about his job. He doesn't want to look like he doesn't know what he's talking about. Either. Yeah. He has to portray like a confidence that you know. I know, you know, I'm in this position of power, I have to portray it. Yeah. I can't let anyone know that I don't know what I'm talking about. 
<laughs> yeah, because if they know, then others found out. Yeah, right. I feel like we're focusing on all the negative stuff. I think that um, from what I get out of this, sure. this guy really believes he's right, and he yeah. really like sees this ambition. Like, I'm sure. gonna do the right thing. I'm gonna just clean everything up, and uh -huh. they're gonna love me. And right. I mean, you could take the fear out, but I really see like you know he uh -huh. thinks like. This is his his God given yeah. responsibility. Sure, you know, sure. So let's play with that for a second. Right. So if so, let's say Joe's really feeling a lot of ambition, right. and then thinks that he's on the right path. If he has those thoughts, what's the feeling underneath those thoughts? What what would be the motivation for thinking I'm doing something that's going to improve my society? Um, um, answer first? My first answer is fear, uh, because fear, so. uh, yeah, he's, he doesn't. You know, he's unsure of what might happen. You know, if those, if the others were, you know, allowed to thrive or you know, be, become a better part of society. So, his view of like cleaning things up is, you know, already rooted in, in a negative uh, energy because he's looking down on other people. So you're scared. Maybe it's even fear that if he doesn't do this, if he doesn't act, then everything's going to fall apart. He's in a position of power, and if he doesn't do something, he's scared that that inaction, that waiting too long, might might result in a lot of a lot of social chaos and problems and whatever. Well, and especially because he's got a duty to do during his term. Yeah, he's only got two years or four years or whatever it is. Does that? Do you feel somewhat complete on that, or do you want to no, delve? That's, no, that's, that's not not that's what you're I, going I think for. Sure, there's two routes, and uh -huh. I don't think they're necessarily mutually exclusive. They're not. I think no. there's one that's right or the other, but no, you know, not right or wrong. you can either look at it like fear, or it could just be one of those guys who's you know like an optimist, and he really actually thinks he's doing the right thing, whether he is or not. You know, that's kind of his ambition is fueled side. by right. it. The lack of logic in his sure. argument. I think he feels Just justified. because he's wrong. Right. Well, you know, like okay. All right. So I want to. I'm going to interject myself here, because what we're getting lost in a little bit um, is we're getting lost into what Joe is thinking or what he's feeling. Well, well, I think there's two different. Maybe this is a good time to make this distinction. Um, there are two things that we we have. Right? We have feelings, our emotions. I feel angry. I feel sad. I feel happy. I feel joyful. Um, and then I think things. I think you're a bad person. I think this plan will save the world. I think I... Um, X is wrong. Yeah. Um, so, so thoughts and feelings are two separate things. And, and often our feelings motivate our thoughts. So often we think something. We think this is the plan that works because we feel... Uh, optimistic about it. We feel hopeful about it. Um, it could be the other way. Sure. Uh -huh. It could go the other way too. Your thoughts Does it affect like, your feelings like Joe's, too. Yes. Joe's feelings. You know that uh, he's do, doing the right thing. Like uh -huh. came come from. I don't know his thoughts. I think. Yeah. It, it definitely is a two way street. Goes back and forth, and they both influence one another. Right. But I want to make a distinction here because, and the reason I want to make a distinction, oh, right. Um, one thing that might be helpful for people is on the back of this, I was going to talk about this later, but we, uh, I'm talking about it now, um, <laughs> is on the back sheet, page six, is a whole list of MVC feelings. It's a feeling list. These are, what, these are just a list of feelings, feelings when you are satisfied and feelings when you're unsatisfied. Um, a whole list of feelings. You don't necessarily need to read all of them. I'm not going to quiz you on them, uh, but take a you know take a look at those. But so the reason I want to make that distinction, why I think that distinction between feelings and thoughts are so important, is it comes back to that enemy, enemy image thing. So if we stick with, we don't connect at the thought level, in my opinion. We trade thoughts, we debate, but we don't connect there as human beings connecting with one another. We connect over shared emotions, over shared trust, over that shared honest and empathetic relationships. That's how we connect. So we don't connect with people when we just want to work with what they're thinking in their brain. Because uh, your brain's all in here. It's not out here. Our relationships are out here. Um, so, so if we want to, so, so why I want to touch on that with Joe is that if we get caught up in whether Joe's thought pattern is logical, 
we're going to conclude, right, that it's illogical. Well, once we, include, once we conclude that Joe's thought progress is illogical, well, then Joe is now wrong. Joe is now misleading. He might be manipulating. It's very easy slippery slipperiness towards from one thought to the next thought. So we don't want to stick with Joe's thinking here. I think we're right that Joe thinks he, he's doing the right thing. He definitely thinks that, but we don't want to connect with him about those thoughts or debate with him on whether he, his thinking is correct. We want to connect with what he's feeling behind. So if Joe thinks he's right, what feeling do you hear uh, under that? Um, enthusiasm. Mm. Yeah. If he thinks like he's the, you know, I'm just the crusader on the white horse, and yeah. I'm just excited about cleaning this place up. Yeah. I can do it. I finally am here. I put in all this long hours of a campaign trail. Put in all this hard work. I promised my constituents I was going to clean up Main Street. And now I'm here. Now I get to do it. And that's exciting, right? When we, when we put in a lot of work uh, to, to get something done and then we're finally at the place where we get to get it done. Or we get to see the completion of a project that we've been working on for months and months and months or years and years and years or decades and decades and decades like legalizing marijuana. <laughs> so does that feel somewhat complete about what Joe might be feeling there? Sure. His enthusiasm? He could feel confident if he mm -hmm. believes he's doing it. He feels confident, which comes out of that enthusiasm, right? Yeah. It just depends on him. Right, right. I mean, it's hard because we're dealing with fictitious people I made up in my brain and I gave you only like <laughs> eight sentences to figure out what Joe's thinking and feeling, but um, yeah. I think he's also feeling love like, toward his mm. kids and his... Yeah. <coughs> Vote for him. Yeah. Right, he cares about his kids. Don't we care about kids too? <laughs> so even if we go down that path, so notice now we've gone down two paths with Joe. One path is that he's scared about his job, and we can all we all just rose our hand. We're like we're all scared about our jobs. Or Joe loves his kids and loves his community, and really and is excited that he's finally in a place where he can help them. And don't we all know that feeling too? Passion. Yeah, that passion. Sense of responsibility. Yeah. I think Joe is just like us, honestly. Just, yeah. I'm just not as informed. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's just not been connected in the right way with the right stuff. Um, so I think everyone kind of got the idea of that exercise. I hope that. We're, empathy the, is a felt experience. We feel what that person feels, and we connect with that. So even though, and it's hard, right? Like reading Joe was hard, right? And, and especially when you're sitting in that lobby room um, and you're talking to them face to face, or you're sitting at home and you read the newspaper, it's hard to read through all the gunk they throw out there, that we throw out there. But if you can do it, there's something underneath there that we can feel too. I think it's more tangible feelings are than thoughts. You know? Yeah. Just like a lot more. They are. They're a lot more. I think that's right. Yeah, I like that a lot. <laughs> so, uh, oh. oh no, I was just going to say it's because every feeling is genuine and unbiased. Mm. Yeah. It's so more honest it than just, a thought. It is. just happens and it occurs. Mm -hmm. I think also we feel that, you know, that it's more tangible. Like the feelings are more tangible than thoughts because we can more easily guess by somebody's expressions or demeanor how they're feeling um, rather than just straight from that what they're thinking. You might be able to interpret what they're thinking from how they seem to be feeling, but it generally comes from. You can't get in there. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I love everything that's being said right now. That really gives me a lot of joy and a lot of optimism that people are, are on the same wavelength with me, and that's really awesome. So thank you all for sharing that. Um, sure, and then I want to move on, but yeah. Oh, fuck, I lost it. Oh, no. <laughs> you always bring it back up, too. By the way, feel free to interrupt me at any point by sticking up your hand. This is not meant to be a me lecture. Like, please interject and talk. It was good, and it'll, I'll, it'll come back. Later. Great, cool. I'll be, I'll be waiting for it in anticipation. Um, so the, now let's look at the second, the, second, the second side of empathy, right? So like I said at the top, empathy, in my opinion, there's two parts. It's a felt experience and it involves actively listening to the other person. And this active listening part, this is really the tools 
um, of how we can work through the gunk of what they throw out there. So this is trying to get at some of the tools we have to, instead of getting caught up in the words Joe uses or the words Sarah uses, but like get through that, which is hard, and then get to the ooey gooey feelings underneath that we can all connect with. That's more real, as many people were talking about, than all the fake it. distractions. Okay. Yeah. So I, I always say that you gotta look for um, reasons to agree, you know, like mm -hmm. things that you have in common. Yeah. Because if you focus on things that you do agree, uh, you know, a common goal, uh -huh. you, know, can, that you get somewhere, but if you focus yeah. on like disagreements, just, Clashes. Yeah. 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 We want to find that sharedness. Yeah. Insightful. I, I like that. To, I needed to get it out. I appreciate it. I'm glad you did get it out, and I'm glad I heard it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, the next exercise is. Um, flip these pages. These statement pairs, um, and I'm just going to read them because they're quick. Uh, but these statement pairs, and I want people to uh, try to answer, there's, uh, there's just one question, it's just, um, is person B uh, giving active listening empathy? That's, that's, that's all we're trying to figure out, is whether person B is trying to, is giving active listening empathy. So anyway, so, so statement pair number one, there are four of them. Person A says, how could I do such a stupid thing? I'm such an idiot. Person B responds, nobody's perfect, it's okay. What you did wasn't the worst thing in the world. So, now do people, how do people, do people think that, um, that, that, that person B is doing active listening or is, is giving empathy? No, why do you think not? I think he's being too broad with his answer. Like, he's kind of generalizing. You know, generalizing. Like, I feel like he's not actually paying attention or like not, didn't think of like a constructive answer to, you know, mm -hmm. make a person feel better. Mm -hmm. Actually, you know, listen. Yeah, now you may, you don't feel, so what I'm hearing is that if you were person A, you wouldn't feel like you were no, being, you were being heard. Mm -hmm. No, you would think the other person wasn't listening yeah. at all. I have uh, Ian and you. I don't, I don't know who raised hands first. I was just gonna say, like, oh, let me go first. Sure. Let me I think a real act of listening there would have been a question. So what did, the, what did that person do? You're just yeah. like, ah, oh, it's fine. You right. don't even know what they did. Yeah, they don't know what they did. Yeah. The, maybe their thought processes aren't on the same track, but mm -hmm. it might be general instead of because of them not. You know. Uh, exactly. It's, it might just be because you don't want to think about what the thoughts are. Exactly. We're connecting uh -huh. to a feeling. You're like, okay, it's cool. Right. What happened, you're fine. We're Everything's okay. It wasn't the worst thing in the world like exactly. you thought it was. We're still sticking with thoughts there. Yeah. You have something in the back? Yeah. I just, I feel like it doesn't go against at all the fact that the other person is calling themselves an idiot and that they did something stupid. It's just like, oh, no one's perfect. Like, yeah, a lot of people are idiots. There's a lot of really bad things in the world. You don't need anywhere near that. Like, there's no, like, ah, oh, like, it wasn't that bad, man. Like, really, like, no one noticed or, like, something like that. You know, it was just, there's nothing positive in it. It's just, like, it could have been way worse, but it could have been, like, the worst thing possible, but uh, I guess it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm gonna take these two and then we're gonna move on. All right, I'll. yeah. Um, yeah, to me, it just seems like if I heard that, it'd feel patronizing. Like, oh, mm. congratulations, you thought of the right thing to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, you check the box. Right. right. This kind of seems kind of obvious to me, but relating it back to how you were talking about feelings, uh -huh. I would have to say that the best way to connect with that person and ask them why they feel that they are stupid or an idiot, instead of telling them, you know, it's okay, you know? Mm -hmm. And then relating to them with why they feel that way. And, uh, yeah. yeah. Excellent. Everyone raised excellent points, which I love. Um, I'm just going to move this forward because time. Um, so statement pair two. Oh, the other thing I was going to say, how many of us see ourselves saying person B's words at a party? What? You're saying that at a party, you're not doing it at a time when you're really connecting with the person. You're doing it because you want to get back to the party. But anyways, so statement pair number two. Person A says, I'm so mad at Steve. He never does the work he volunteers for. Person B responds, you feel like Steve doesn't contribute enough to the group. 
Now is, is person B giving active listening empathy? I think so. He's trying to elaborate. Uh huh. Guy in the back. I think he's person B is really trying to understand why person A is actually feeling about the situation the way he is, trying to get to the root cause of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Person B is active listening, but not empathizing. Mm -hmm. Like you heard, and you're getting there, but you don't <coughs> feel what they're feeling yet. Yeah, yeah. My personal opinion on it is closer to that. Um, so let me let me maybe clarify this out. This was a little bit of a tricky one I put in there because I used the word feel. Because often people will use the word feel when they're talking about a thought. They're trying to trick you. Because um, he doesn't. Because uh, person A doesn't feel uh, that Steve doesn't contribute enough to the group. Person A thinks Steve doesn't contribute enough to the group. Person A may feel unsupported. Person A may feel like he or she doesn't have enough help, but that doesn't have to come from Steve. More people in the group than Steve is. <coughs> so Steve doesn't have to be, and we're going to get into that in a, uh, a little bit later, um, but if, if we're talking about individual people, we're rarely talking about a need. There may be, there's going to be, there's probably a need underneath that. But rarely, if we're talking about just one individual person, at the surface level, at least, we're not talking about. We're talking about, I want person X to do X, Y, Z, and when they don't do X, Y, Z, I'm mad. And, uh, and that's not about, I don't need person X to do X, Y, Z. I just need someone to do it. It doesn't matter if it's Karen or if it's Mike. It could be, it could be Karen or Mike and both of them or no, neither of them in person Z. You know? so, um, so that's something I, I, I put in there as a trick. Um, try and trick y'all too. Um, it's all about tricks. So, is there any other uh, pressing things people want to say about statement pair two? Yeah. Um, active <coughs> listening. Active, you um, it takes trying to understand, and you have to ask questions to understand stuff. So. Questions are important. Show, I mean, yeah. uh, it's showing that that you're asking questions like shows empathy in itself because mm. you know, you're trying. You're trying. You're at least trying. You're making an effort. And that is better than what person did. You know, seems a little better than what the first pair did. Yeah, step in the right direction. He wasn't, yeah, first one, they weren't trying. He just, like you said, wanted to get back to the party. Yeah. The other thing is, like, it almost kind of seems like person B might not be listening. He's like, mm -hmm. he's the first person just said, you know, like, I'm, I'm unhappy. He expressed the fact that he was unhappy with one particular person. And he was like, oh, you're not happy with him? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. It's just a restatement. Yeah. yeah. So let's go to statement pair three. Um, so statement pair three, person A says, uh, I get so exhausted when all I do is go from meeting to meeting with short breaks in between in which I make copies, study, take exams, and publicize the next event. I don't know, it sounded like a break to me. Person B, oh, I so know how you feel. I'm always running around with a million things to do too. Now, do people feel, how do, do people think that person B is giving any sort of empathetic active listening there? I have a blue shirt. I would, say, I would say absolutely not because we tend to think that when people are telling us something that they want advice or they want us to tell us how we feel or our shared experiences, but they just want us to listen. Kind of yeah. just using that mirroring helps us, well, us like to understand them and for them to understand what they need. Yeah, and someone in the far back. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't believe they're really being empathetic. It's oftentimes certain people will just like to use any conversation to talk more about themselves. Mm -hmm. And if the individual, a person A, has some sort of underlying cause that's predicate, it's creating all of the stress, but they're not yet comfortable saying it. By person B saying, "Oh, I know how you feel." That could really offend person A, who knows that they're not dealing with the thing that they made. Yeah, I may have guessed wrong when I say I know how I feel. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, like, feeding off the last two comments, it's sort of like, this can easily devolve into, like, a competition of, like, who's got more stress, you know, like, yeah. whose life sucks more. Right? Uh, yeah. So. Yeah. 
Yeah, and that's not helping. That's not that's not connecting. Yeah, I felt like uh, the first part of the question B is about the state and it could be somewhat <coughs> helpful just to, like, to build a common ground of understanding with the feeling, but the second part seems somewhat dismissive because it's taking yeah. out of the context of their own problems and making it something. It's not about me. Yeah. I think like just being agreeable for the sake of being agreeable, you know, just mm -hmm. to continue the conversation and you know, yeah. try to just talk to someone. Yeah. So I love what everything everyone has just said. Um, that was, I mean, fantastic. Yeah, I mean, spot on with what my notes had. So let's look at the fourth one. Um, so I'm happy, by the way. I just want to pause here. I'm so happy that we're, that we're oh, this is so good. This is, oh, I love how. Okay. Uh, we'll so, cuddle after. Oh, <laughs> 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 All right. So statement pair uh, number four. Person A says, "I'm freaking out. We have a huge event this weekend, and there are a million things to do. I can't hold. I can't get a hold of anyone to help me, and I'm feeling like I'm going to pass out any minute. And if this event doesn't go well." No one on this campus will ever take SSDP seriously ever, ever again. Seems like the world can end. Right? Uh, doesn't it feel that way sometimes though? Uh, and person B responds, Oh my gosh. You sound so exhausted. Sounds like you're really scared about what's going to happen Saturday. Sounds like it's so scary because you're not getting the support you need. And you're worried that if this fails, you'll lose the respect of the student body and maybe the administration. So yeah, so how do people feel about that statement pair? Was person B actually giving active listening and connecting empathetic? Yeah, very well thought out. Yeah. So we have to be able to do that, by the way, split second of a normal conversation. Yeah. Right? It's hard, it takes a lot of training, but you can do it. And then think about when you do that, how well you connect with that other person. Mm -hmm. And how that person now feels that you heard all that. So in all that statement, I heard all those things. Even just like having, oh, sorry. Uh -huh. sorry, even just having somebody connect like that, you know, even if it doesn't solve yeah. itself, it can make you feel so much better that the problem is become this Yeah. Like, Support people. Yeah. <coughs> right. Someone's there to help you carry the load a little bit. I feel like a good, uh, response and a good conversation not only um, interacts with the person who had just said something before but provides them an outlet to just <coughs> bounce off of what you said and then you know they can say yeah I am feeling like this so there's not sort of that lag and your your response not only understands what they're feeling but provides them an outlet to express and maybe go into maybe a little bit more depth about this one. I'm going to take these two and then I think we have to move on. I, I also think similarly that answers that provide you some sort of applicable solution are really great. I know they're not possible in every situation, but something like this, you know, maybe this would be the comment that pushed them over the edge to be like, you know, like if you see this too, like I really am going to take the extra step and ask my other fellow SSDP members to like really put more time into this, express to them how stressed out I am, and like having someone else listen to your story and come to that conclusion on their own can really help you justify your own actions and know that you're doing the right thing. Yeah. So you one more hand. Uh -huh. um, also, I really like that it says it sounds like with a question mm -hmm. because you're allowing them to say, no, it, that's not how I feel. Yes. Um, and you're not putting words in their mouth. Yes. So you're saying, like, if I'm getting this correctly, you know, this is what I'm hearing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Spot on. That's, that's very, very good key uh, observation because that's a lot of what we're doing when we're doing that active listening is we are, so that leads me to say, what empathy is, uh, another way of putting what empathy is, in my opinion, is when we turn all of our mirror neurons on to the point where we become just a literal emotional mirror for the other person. And now they're just looking at themselves via us, uh, which allows them to write, to clarify things, to correct things, to say, oh, no, 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 I don't actually feel that. I don't think that. Um, but it, when they don't have that mirror to be able to examine that stuff, they may not be able to realize that what they're saying isn't actually connecting with what they're feeling and thinking. And giving them that space and that mirror, they can kind of realize, oh, no, I'm not, 
it doesn't seem like I am communicating effectively right now. Maybe I need to rephrase what I'm saying. Uh, and in all of safe, I'm just looking at a mirror of myself situation, not a competitive or fighting situation. I was just gonna say, uh -huh. it like evenly re redistributes the weight of all mm -hmm. of the feelings onto everybody, and you're just all on the same trip. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the last thing I'm gonna say. Oh, I'm yeah. Sorry. Sure. That statement, like her mirror neurons, mm -hmm. um, when you said you're <coughs> act of turning them on. Yeah. Uh, how do you do that? What do I mean by that? Yeah. Um, like, like, how do we do that? that? Is everything we've just been doing, okay. I think, today. Where we looked at those stories, we kind of processed and feel the feelings that Joe and Sarah are feeling. We do this active listening. I mean, we want to be present with the person and perceiving what they're feeling. And within all of us, this is going to get a little sciencey, and I do have to keep us moving because I would. This, this is only half the presentation. We're now way over half my time, and uh, anyways, my timing was not well done for this. But um, basically, within all of us, we have mirror neurons um, that, when we see uh, the classic example is when we see someone in pain, we feel pain, right? If you think about uh, all those home videos of dad gets whacked in the crotch with a baseball bat, we like, oh, like even especially men do, but like women do it even a little bit. I noticed they wince a little bit. They they even understand, oh, that's painful. <laughs> Uh, that's your mirror on your own activating. Okay. That's what that is. So this is just trying to tap into that and do that whenever we want to, not just when it's for. That's a situation where we're on the, we almost have no option but to respond that way. Or, you know, uh, if, we, if anyone saw Siriano and they pull out the guy's fingernails, oh, um, right. Uh, like we just gutturally react that way because we have to. This is trying to take that guttural thing that's already in us. We're already biologically predisposed to do this. How can we tap in and do it with it, like whenever we want and actively? Yeah, awesome. Right? <laughs> right? Awesome. Um, the last thing I'll say about empathy, and then I have to move on, is about we also uh, have to learn about giving ourselves an, uh, empathy. And if we give ourselves empathy, <sighs> that helps a lot. <laughs> um, that helps a lot in deconstructing enemy images of other people. That helps a lot in deconstructing enemy images of ourselves. Um, it helps with a lot of things. Uh, and uh, I don't have enough time to really go into it more. But learning about giving yourself empathy. Doing everything we just learned today about with Joe and Sarah and actively listening and trying to tease out the deeper feelings and needs that are really going on and getting out of our mental thought patterns. If we can do that with ourselves. <sighs> yeah, it's OK to be wrong. Yeah, it's OK yeah, to be wrong. wrong. <laughs> um, it's okay. enlightening to realize it. Yeah, it is. It is. And it gets easier. You know, it does. To learn how to be wrong. Yes. So the second part of what nonviolent communication is. Um, something I call, I have a mnemonic device called old friends never run. O-F-N-R. Four things. Observation, feelings, needs and requests um, as a way that we communicate. But this is not meant to be a language that we always communicate in. These are kind of four areas we want our minds to focus on. OFNR is a great practice tool um, to get our minds to focus on that. And many people, including myself, find it very useful to communicate in OFNR um, for a lot of reasons. Uh, but then there are a lot of drawbacks because it sounds very jarring. Anyways, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's actually get into the meat of it. Uh, so observation, <coughs> when I say an observation, I mean a photographic observ a picture. If we took a camera and took a snapshot of what happened, that's what we want to be saying in an observation. Um, so by that I mean something that is judgment free. So when, uh, an example I like a lot is if you're sitting in one of these panels and you're in the back and someone else is talking and you're trying to listen, you might be prone to turn to that person and say, hey, stop interrupting. So you've made an observation that person's interrupting. But it's not really a photographic observation. That's an observation mixed in with a judgment. You're being rude. You're interrupting. Interrupting is an evaluative term that says, that you're not considering the other person's time. A photographic observation of that same instance might be, you know, you're talking at the same time that that other person's talking. You've just eliminated that word interrupt. 
And what that gives you is that when you say you're interrupting, uh, when someone says that to me, I say, no, I'm not. I don't interrupt people. I'm not rude. I learned my P's and Q's. <laughs> now we're going to get, and then the other person comes back at me and says, yes, you are interrupting. No, I'm not. And I, we're now just debating whether I'm interrupting. And now we're, none of us are hearing the panel, and it's just a joke. Um, you're not talking about what's actually going on. You're talking about, um, you're trying to even, you're still trying to get to what's going on. And so often we get lost at that step. Uh, so let's do, so I have a couple of examples here. Um, I'll shoot through them and see whether people think that they are photographic observations or whether they're just uh, evalu if they're something else. So the first one, Tim didn't ask for the group's input during the meeting. Is that, an obs is that a photographic observation of what Tim did during the meeting? No, I saw a no. Um, well, it depends because Tim may have thought that he considered other people's input, even though he may not have directly asked. Sure. So Tim may think he considered other people's input, but if he at no point in the meeting asks, what do people think about this? You know, then this observation becomes very real. I, I intended the answer to be yes. I could see how the answer may be no, and we could talk about that, but I intended that to be an easy yes. Easy yes off the bat that everyone could get. Yeah, I think that's yes because if it was no, it would be more Tim didn't consider the group. Mm, that might be more of a no, right? If I had written it as Tim didn't consider what other people are thinking, yeah, then I'm making more of a judgment about what Tim or is or is not doing inside of his head. Versus you didn't ask for anything in the meeting. Ask in the meeting. Good, 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 good. Second one. Sarah never listens to anyone and does everything by herself. Yeah. Judgment. That word never, never and everything. Yeah. Generalizations, Absolutes. right? Absolutes are generally like a made name, right? Generally <laughs> judgments. They're generally judgments if we're making a generalization or an absolute statement. That's generally going to be that's that should be a red flag when you hear that, oh this person's about to make a judgment. Not always. But generally, that's about to be what's the next sentence, the next words out of their mouth are going to be a judgment. Um, the third one, Bob left the materials for the busted screen at home. Observation. Observation, photographic, that's what happened. No one can argue with that. What we're getting at is observations that no one can argue with. Bob can't come back and say, no, I didn't. <laughs> yeah, you did, Bob. The DVD's at your house. Like, well, I, don't, I don't know how we're going to debate this here. Like, you know, like, so, you know, we want things that you can't debate over. So that's an observation. I think the last one everyone's going to get. Fred complains whenever we plan an event. Judgment. Judgment. Okay, complains. Whenever. Yeah. Whenever. Also, I wanted to point out, um, how do people feel about the word complain? It's, it's really like, why are you talking so much? Mm. I feel like there could be a better word for it. There could be a better word for it. Because it kind of has like a really I don't know, sort of negative connotation to it, you know? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So you can see a lot of what we're working on here is just our language choice. An observation, we're, we're, it's about word choicing. And whether we want to choose words that we know have connotations that create fight, flight, or freeze reactions in other people, mm. or do we want to choose words that we know will avoid the fight, flight, and freeze reaction in other people. That's what's going on in the observation phase of this OFNR. I definitely think when people hear what, they, they're, what they've said being called a complaint, they don't feel like it's been well received. Yeah. It's like annoying to everyone else, you know? Right. They hear that judgment, those judgmental terms. Yeah. So if I wanted to make a, an observation, but actually make an observation using, you know, that type of statement. Fred. How, how could I change it using Fred? Using the Fred one? Yeah. Sure. Um, so I wrote down, I, I thought people might ask that. All right. So I, so what I wrote as being an alternative might be, when we planned a busted screening last week, Fred would repeatedly bring up problems, but wasn't interested in hearing any of the solutions. That might be uh, a more, even that, I might like to tweak but you a little said bit. He more. wasn't interested. You had, yeah, it, you'd have to he say didn't. he doesn't appear. He didn't, he didn't appear. He didn't appear interested. People at the front here are suggesting that I might have reworded that to say um, what he didn't express interest. He didn't express interest in solutions. Might have been a softer way. I agree. The way I wrote that is kind of last minute and fast. But um, yeah, it, it, that I agree that that part of the statement's where I kind of get a little queasy. But I couldn't 
my imagination wasn't big enough, so thank you for providing tools. Um, yeah, so that might be, does that help you get a better yeah, idea know. about what you can say to Fred? Yeah. 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 Or even if you want to talk about how he generally feels like he says whenever you could say, he often um, contributes input that is more negative. Or, or uh, disturb, like, is unsatisfying or is unsettling to some group members. Mm. I have I have some concerns with that are not satisfying, but um, but that's okay. Uh, I think just if the place to complain with express concerns. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Express expresses concerns. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then maybe and then so observations we don't stop there, right? There's three more things we have to say. <laughs> that's just sentence one. So um, so don't think that the sentence we say here about our observation needs to be so we might say something like Fred gives input that. Is what? What did we say? Um, is more net. Is expresses concerns. That's what we said. Expresses concerns, and then the next thing it might be that makes me feel. I feel uh, anxious about that because my need for productivity and contribution are being met. But anyways, we're gonna get to what I just said in the. Yeah. Yeah. No, I was actually uh -huh. doing. The, yeah. Yeah. About the feelings, where like once you change it from them to me. Yeah. Uh, it completely makes it a non-threatening statement. Yeah. Yeah. I statements are very important. Mm -hmm. And if you're identifying your feelings, it makes it easier for other people to feel empathetic to them. Because mm -hmm. they can mm -hmm. be verified of whether they're feeling right about what you're doing. Yeah. 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 And I love that because that leads right into the next F, feeling. So feeling, and this is when I was going to point out that chart in the back. There's that whole chart of feelings you could talk about. Um, feelings are, excuse me, they're statements about our emotions, right? They're just statements about our emotions with no mixture of evaluation. Again, this is going to be a common thing. No mixture of judgments or evaluations in there. So let's go through a few quick examples. Um, well, uh, I feel like you're not helping the group enough. Judgment? I hear judgment. I saw some other shaking of heads. Uh, yeah, I think you could. Re this is one where you could replace feel with think. Yeah. Yeah, I have a thought here. I have an opinion that you don't help enough. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. Yeah, again, people will use the word feel when really they should be using the word think. Not should. I don't like that word. Anyways. Um, <laughs> but, uh,. Uh, should implies moralistic judgments, and uh, we can get into that later. Um, so let's go to example number two. I feel frustrated when I think about all the work <coughs> I have to do. Yeah, I, that's. I think it's that right there. I, I, I feel. I'm just yeah. 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 yeah, that's a feel. Yeah, and I would be in agreement with you all that that's that's a statement about a feeling. That's not, I'm just, that's how I feel right now when I think about those things. Um, I'm sad that you're not going to support the medical amnesty policy. Uh, no, I mean, that's, that's kind of like, it's a, uh, I think it's a feeling statement, definitely, but I think it's kind of being pushy a little bit. Yeah, like you can't force it onto someone else. Yeah. You know, like, it's judging them for not supporting it. And like, it's not like going in the group because you're ideal. Well, I don't think it's sad as what you feel. It seems like you call me looking well, I think for that's money. judgment saying that that person doesn't feel so much. That's just my I'm sure. Interesting. I'm, I'm getting interesting reactions. Sure. I, I disagree with that. I think if this person had said, I feel, I feel that you should, or I feel like you should, uh -huh. or just, that would be very judgmental. But right. Because he's just talking about his own personal experience. And obviously right. Everyone experiences things in their own way, so we need to express that. Honestly. Right. Yeah. Honestly. So I, yeah. I think this is honest. Uh -huh. It's a personal evaluation of um, an observation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and do you mean that to mean that it's a, a it's, judgment? It's, it's your <coughs> expressing your feelings. Mm -hmm. You're expressing your, your feelings. There's, a, there's an observation tacked onto that. It's, sure. It's a truthful observation. There's an observation. You're, you're not linking supporting. an emotion of yours with mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Right, right. So I, I got a lot of interesting reactions to that. I, I think that this is a, a statement of a feeling. I think this is a statement of of I made an observation that you are not supporting the medical amnesty policy, that results and I am now feeling sad that I'm seeing that in the world. 
just a, just an just a, a observ it's almost an observation about my feeling. If you want to think about it that way, when we talk about feelings, we want to make observations about our feelings. Um, so it's interesting. Um, maybe there were some things I could tweak in that example to make that a little clearer. It's interesting that I got so many people that thought it was a judgment, um, but unfortunately, I don't think. Yeah, I don't have time to go into that right now. But um, uh, so I'm going to move on to need and. Um, so a need, and I've kind of been beating around the bush of needs, I've been mentioning them here and there, and I wish I had more time for this, but um, needs are a lot of the cornerstone of what MVC is about. It's about connecting with your personal needs and the needs of other people. And you can see on the very last page, there's a list of and none of these lists, the feelings list or the needs list, are not uh, all inclusive. They contain all the needs and feelings that ever have been experienced in the whole wide world. But they're supposed to help you kind of get you. You can look at those need lists, and you can see it's pretty wide. We need things such as honesty and peace and autonomy and food and water. But we also need things like play and joy and humor and creativity and love. So anyway, so we have a lot of needs. We're very needy people, and we don't like to think that we're needy people, but we are. We have needs, and other people have needs, and that's what, uh, and that's a big distinction of what I was talking about earlier when I was saying we're moving from conflict situations to cooperative situations. We're moving from situations where I get what I want, I anti you, to let's meet everyone's needs. Now, the way you meet everyone's needs. What, what people often say is that one, for, to be happy or to achieve better happiness, one would want to cling tightly to needs and hold loosely strategies. Strategies are things that we want. Strategies are wants that we have to meet needs. So I might need reliable transportation to get to work. I want a Ferrari. Right? Two different things there. One is a strategy and one is a need. This Ferrari is a strategy, right? I, I, I need reliable transportation to, to get to work. I've come up with a strategy to do that and that strategy is to go and buy a Ferrari. Then, you know, whether you can actually actualize that strategy or not is a whole other thing. But you see that the, buying the Ferrari is just a strategy to, uh, is just a plan of action to meet a need. And your plan of action is, well, you may have a preferred plan of action. I want a Ferrari. That is my preferred method of getting that need met. And that's the difference. We want everyone's needs to be met, not everyone's preferred. Your preferred strategy may not be always what you get in the end. You may not get the Ferrari. But if we work on it, we can at least get you reliable transportation to work. Um, so, Oh, and then a, a, a good way that I found to figure out whether you're talking about a strategy or a deeper need is an acronym PLATO, which stands for person, location, action, uh, time, uh, or object. So if, a, if any of those things are in your statement, a person, uh, location, action, time, or object, you're talking about a strategy. You're not talking about a need. And you, I mean, you're talking, there's needs under your strategies, right? There's something there, but you'll want to push yourself, you'll want to push your listening of the other person a little bit deeper to try to figure out, all right, they're talking about that they want the Ferrari, but what is it that they really, what's really driving that? And then we can connect with that. Because I might not be able to connect well with someone who says I want a Ferrari. I can't afford a Ferrari. I, can, you know, I don't connect well with that. But I can connect with, I need reliable transportation to work. Yeah, I can connect with that, right? Um, so so if, if any of those are present, then we're probably talking about a strategy <laughs> over a need. Um, that's a helpful guide. So let's, let's do a couple of these examples. Um, I feel angry when you, when you say that because I want some respect for my hard work. And when you say that, all I hear is an insult. Is that an honest expression of an observation, feeling, and a need not getting met? I would agree with everyone. Yeah. It's 
pretty honest, like, you say X, I didn't put when what X is, but you know, you, you would probably want to say, you know, when you say whatever it is that they say, um, you know, and quote it. If you can quote, that's so much better than when the way we make generalizations, because you can just, again, if it's all about taking that photograph, when you said those words, they can't debate, they know they said those words, it came out of their mouth, they heard it too. Then I feel this, and I need that, and all that, right? Um, so, uh, I have a need for respect. We all have needs for respect, right? And we feel angry when those needs aren't being met. I, I like that you're emphasizing the importance of the observational statement, because I mm -hmm. feel like a lot of times our emotions get in the way of, our, of the like, validity of our observations, and we'll tend to exaggerate the situation, Yeah. and that'll just exacerbate. Yeah. Um, yeah, because we get into you know, those emotional responses fire off our adrenaline, which shoots us into that fight or flight well, freeze reaction. And then all of a sudden they become an enemy image. We've created an image of them without seeing who they really are. Yeah. I also like how they say all I hear is an insult rather than you're insulting me. So yeah. it's not a judgment, it's more of a how I feel and how I see it. Yeah, yeah sure, Cody, and just kind of you know, straight out with it. Yeah. I feel this way. I do. Yeah, absolutely. That's spot on. It's all about, and it, it's a, and, and part of that, why I put it in like that, is it's about taking responsibility. The person just took responsibility. I feel, I hear an insult. That's about me. I'm not saying you gave me an insult. I'm taking responsibility for what I'm hearing. This is what I hear. Not, you know, I, I'm asking for help so I don't hear that in the future. That's part of what this person, we're going to get to what the request is the fourth part, um, you know, it's not in this example, but the request is, you know, how do I not hear that? Help me not hear an insult when you say those words. But it's still, I'm taking responsibility that I'm hearing it. You may or may not be intending to send me an insult. I don't know. You may think that you have very good intentions behind saying what you said. Maybe you don't mean that. <coughs> Whatever. Yeah, absolutely. I feel insulted is better than, or avoid the fight, flight, freeze reaction. Uh, that you're insulting me activates. Um, so let's go to the next one. Uh, I'm pissed that you left the, f the busted film at your house. Is that expressing uh, that word feelings and needs? Mm -hmm. It's your feelings. Yeah. There's an object location. There's an object location. Yeah, he, does, he hasn't said anything that he needs, really. Ob object location, you left that thing and that house and it needs to be at this place with that now. What did you think about um, anger being a secondary emotion? Yeah, yeah, no, all right, so that, yeah, so that comes up in NBC all the time. I actually wasn't gonna go into that in this talk, uh, but the next level of NBC would go into the fact that anger isn't real, that really there's some, anger is motivated as a, a, an un, felt feel, a, a feeling of dissatisfaction, if you look at that chart. It's one of those feelings when you're not satisfied combined with the judgment of should. So I feel sad and you shouldn't have made me feel sad. Now I'm angry. If we stick with I'm sad, we don't get angry. If I don't move, take the next step of you shouldn't have done that, then I don't have to be angry. I can just stick with sadness and it's so much, I know, uh, we fear the vulnerability of sadness and expressing that, and now that person knows I'm sad, and now I'm vulnerable to them. But the connection is so much better. So much better. Yeah, I know, time. Um, so let's get to number four. No, you're actually like... Yeah, it's like 12, 7. Okay, well, I need to at least do the last part. I need to do requests. I know. I'm, I, I apologize for any unmet needs that me going late is going to cause, but I need to at least get out what request is. Um, requests are doable, and this is, a, they're doable, specific, and they're positive. Requests are not, stop doing that. Requests are, please do this. Requests are not, give me more respect. Requests are, next time will you ask for my permission. Requests are, uh, you know, not uh, gain superpowers and save uh, my baby from the fire, requests are call the fire department. You know, they're doable, they're specific, and they're positive. And then there are three types of requests. Um, connection requests, uh, I'm hoping you'd be willing to help me understand what's going on for you. Partnership requests, I'm wondering if you'd be willing to work with me on this so we are both happy. 
so we can meet all the needs. Uh, and action requests. I'm hoping you'd be willing to do, or I'd be, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that you'd be willing to wait until I finish speaking, and then I will remain silent while you speak. So those are three different kind of categories of requests. Um, obviously, some encourage more of that relationship and connection than others. However, some require more time than others do. So you want to use one of you know the, those three requests types of requests, connection requests, partnership re requests, and action requests. You want to weigh what's, you know, whether you have time or whether you are, I have enough time to delve into relationships. I know I'm way over, uh, so I think we have to end there. But... Well, thank you all, um, and thank you for listening and, and being so attentive. They'll see a couple of things before everyone runs away. Um, you'll see that there are lots of more activities in that handout that I covered uh, in this talk. So feel free to go home and do them yourself, especially the last activity in that handout, which is called dissolving or breaking down or something like that, enemy images, which is a fantastic exercise where you can take something in your own personal life and really break it apart using OFNR and figure out what's going on there. And then if anyone would like, I have business cards up here, contact information for me, it's also in your handout. Uh, I do this sort of thing all the time and would be willing to do it many, many times if anyone wants to contact me uh, to do presentations with their groups, to do mediation on conflicts, or to do talks, awesome whatever. Very yeah. nice or you just need help in the meantime. Awesome, thanks guys.